Barcelona for this other thing when I was here. And so, uh, Anish, which I'm pronouncing. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, there you are. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so let's just get started. I'm mean, going to go pretty fast. So, who am I? Uh, I'm a hacker. I work on config management shit at Red Hat. Uh, I write a technical blog called The Technical Blog of James. Who's seen it before? Just raise your hand. Um, if you haven't seen it, just raise your hand anyway, so I seem really popular. Yeah, put away the phone, put away the laptop, raise your hand. All right. I'm actually a physiologist by training, so I don't know how I got into this computering shit, but if you want to talk about physiology, please let me know. And I'm into DevOps and DevOps tools and these sorts of things. Uh, just for fun, are you guys all like Linux, GNU, system in, DevOps people? Anyone know nothing about computers at all? Uh, I'm going to go like, whose who's things are like pro skills? Pro skills? Raise your hand. Don't be shy. Shit skills? It's okay. okay. Um, if, if I'm going too fast for something you really don't understand, uh, let me know. Who's never heard of, say, Puppet or Ansible or any of these sorts of tools? Raise your hand. Um, who's really shy and hates raising their hands? Just let me know where you are. Anybody? Okay, I'm actually really shy. Alright, so we're going to go uh, a bit fast. Basically just the, the fundamental um, thing is that we have these tools for managing clusters of servers. And I was basically unhappy with them, so I wrote a new one. Um, and basically the idea is you declaratively ask the servers to be in a certain state, and then hopefully your tool runs and gets you there. Uh, I'm going to show you what the sort of new state of the art according to me is. Um, if you're familiar with some of the existing tools, this might be a little bit more significant to you, but if not, um, you know, and all this material is all online, so you can go over it if you're really, really lost. Okay? Cool. Uh, so people might have actually remembered some of my old puppet hacks. Um, there's actually sound right now, but you can't hear it because there's just my laptop speakers. This is speaker just screaming because everything's on fire. Um, so I started hacking with Puppet, that's this tool I was talking about, quite a long time ago, around this release of the tool. I think I got fairly good at this. Um, I wanted to really build very powerful autonomous systems uh, using Puppet, which was the tool that I knew. Um, so it turns out in Puppet, you can actually do all sorts of absurd things. And to try and build these fancy systems, I found out you could actually do recursion in Puppet. Who's done some Puppet? Like, you don't want to do this. If you want to look at it, you actually can. You can do this thing, so Puppet runs typically every 30 minutes. But if you want to run it again right now, you can do this thing where Puppet has an exec resource, which double forks away, and then waits till that parent process exits. And then when that exits, it forks off a new Puppet command right away, which is kind of a hack, but it actually works. Um, you can do this thing where you can have a timer that I built in Puppet, uh, where basically you have the same sort of double fork trick, but instead what happens is um, you wait, say, two hours, and then run again. So if you're building like a DRBD cluster and you want to converge it and then wait and then run some new command, you can do that sort of thing. And you can even build finite state machines in Puppet, which again, this was just a sort of exercise in pushing Puppet, but uh, uh, it was an interesting learning experience for me. So um, the real question is, are you here for this? Yes, yes. Come sneak in, you missed the good part, but it's okay. Um, we're just starting. Um, so after building all these high level hacks, I really um, sat down and asked myself, is this really the right way to do it? These like huge hacks on top of Puppet. What do you guys think? <laughs> no. So this is my. What did someone say? This is great. Uh, this is my guy who explains this. Um, he's just no about this whole process. And it's all known. So long story short, um, I after some number of years I had taken a lot of ideas that I had come up with just thinking about Puppet and so on. And I sat down and just wrote a new thing. Uh, it's called MGMT because I'm shit naming things. Uh, some kind person even made me stickers, so I have a few stickers if you really want a sticker. But let me show you why you're going to want a sticker. So, um, blah, 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 we have a computer. Um, so here's the three main design principles about the tool. And I'm going to go through each one and show you some demos. So the first is that per machine, it runs the graph of resources, which I'm going to show you in a minute, in parallel. So no one else seems to do this, and I don't really know why. The second thing is it's event-driven, which means we can respond instantly when things change or when we want to change the state. And uh, the third is it runs as a distributed system. So you don't have this central point of failure in the cluster, um, and I think that's quite elegant. I'll show you these three things one at a time. Sound good? Who's still sleeping? Come on, wake up. It's hard. I know like dinner time's at 8, it's super late, and everyone's hungry. But, um, so here's just a graph. Um, so does this work? OK, there's no. So these blue. Um, boxes here, these basically represent the resources. Uh, basically little units of work that you might want to do. So creating a file, starting or stopping a service, or doing some other fun thing. And the black arrows here represent uh, the dependencies. So you want one to happen before two, two before three, and so on. Uh, five before seven, etc. Um, and what actually happens in the current state of most tools is they do something called a topological sort. 
And what that means is they basically, since they can only run one thing at a time, they basically follow this red arrow. So they do these three, four, five, six, and then seven. Make sense? But as you know, just from looking at this graph, we can actually run everything on the left at the same time as everything on the right. So once 1a is finished running, these two can both run in parallel, and then once they're both finished, uh, this one can run. Does that make sense? You want to see a demo of this? We have a no. Previous error All right. three to four meant that it couldn't, that you had to complete three before four. Correct. Minutes. It could have been that these four ran and then these ones ran. This is just arbitrary about how it chose the left first or the right first. But all tools currently can only run one thing at a time. Okay, so the black ones represent, uh, black arrows represent what has to happen yeah. before. Correct. These are the rules. So the boxes are the things we want to do. And we actually say somehow that I don't want this to happen. Um, I want this to happen before five and six. And so the engines typically figure out this topological sort and they just pick an order that is safe. Because the black things are rules that we must preserve. Okay? Um, basically sort of things like you want to install your web server package before you start the service. Otherwise it wouldn't make sense. What are the, uh, Sorry? What are the red ones again? The red arrow is just basically um, what an engine did. So if you ran this through Puppet, Puppet would happen to run it this way. Oh. Um, and in MGMT, as I said, we can run in parallel. So everything on the left can run on the same time as everything on the right. And once this is finished running, these two can both run in parallel. So let me show you a demo of this. I'll actually, I'll show you this graph. So there's going to be three resources here. Uh, this one takes about 10 seconds to run. This one takes 10 seconds. And this one takes 10 seconds for whatever reason. And this one here takes 15 seconds. So if this ran in parallel, how long should this take to run? It is really weird looking at a big screen over there. OK, uh, so what I'm going to do, so, um, I'm just going to run this graph, and MGMT runs continuously, which we'll get to in a moment. So I can actually say, when the graph has converged for some number of seconds, please shut down. And this will make it easier for us to time it. So in here I have this converge timeout equals 5. So we said, how many seconds to run the graph? 30. 30, plus we're going to wait 5 more seconds, and we're going to time this whole thing. All right? Let's just see it running, and the other two things are just debug options, because I'm in a dev environment. Does the entity work? Oh my god. No. <laughs> what? Sorry. Uh -oh. Uh oh. What's going on? It's not working. Okay, there we go. Just need some. So it starts up, you can see here uh, the 15 second thing and the 10 second thing are start running. You should see here it's going to go through. Uh, 10 seconds are going to finish. And that second thing, that second piece on the left is going to start running. Five seconds after that, you can see that long 15 second operation ran in parallel and finished. Five more seconds later, you can see that uh, that third piece at the bottom is running, which you see happening right now. That's going to run five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It should finish. If nothing happens for five seconds, it should shut down. See, four, five, perfect. And the whole thing shut down, and it ran in about 36 seconds. So basically, the idea is, there's, in this case, about one second of overhead to start up and do some work. So the engine is extremely, extremely fast. Anyone who's ran Puppet, how long does it take Puppet to even start up and run? Anybody? It takes tens of seconds sometimes or longer. So the tool is very fast and it runs in parallel. Make sense? Any questions? Should we go on? I have many more demos if you're excited. But if you're lost, you're going to tell me. Yeah. You guys want to sit over there somewhere? Okay. okay. We'll move on. Um, so the second thing is that um, we're event driven. So what does this mean? So if you run Puppet, for example, and Puppet runs, goes through, and then finishes, and then something changes on your machine, or you want to change the state, you're not going to be able to know until 30 minutes have gone by, and it goes and fixes it, right? So if we could run sort of when something changes, it would be much better. So um, let me actually show you. I'll just demo demo here. So this is I'm a little awkward with the keyboard because I'm used to my keyboard, so I really can type normally, just for the record. Not a total plus. And the keys are all labeled weird things, so you should get like some points for guessing where they are. So I'm going to just go into this directory here. OK, it's good. So this directory, everyone's seen terminals, yes? Be more sincere with your yeses, please. Yes. yes. OK, good, because this is all terminally. Um, so I'm going to go here, and I'm going to run a particular um, example. So now the way we describe the graphs that we run we don't actually have a nice way to do this yet. We're actually building a language that describes the graph, and there's a whole <coughs> conversation about that. But in the meantime, we just have raw data structures, which we dump into YAML files, just to make testing uh, work nicely. And so this is the graph that I'm actually going to run. 
This is just, again, the raw data structure of OCIP. Sorry about that. We're going to ask MGMT to create three files. So temp MGMT F1, F2, and F3. And they're going to say in their contents, I'm F1, I'm F2, I'm F3. We also have a fourth one, F4, which says state is absent. So we don't want this to be created. Oops. There we go. Um, so let's just run this here. That's big enough, right? So I'm just going to run it on the left. And then I'm going to go over and switch to the right and see what happened on this machine. Are you ready? So I run this. It starts up. By the time I can go over here, you can see that three files have been created. So really, really quickly. We can actually just tap the contents, and you can see that it's as we expected. But here's the cool thing. So MGMT is running continuously. So if we remove F2, oops, and new list, you can see the file came right back. We declared the state. Um, we can remove F2 and tap type very quickly. We can actually just do this. We can remove F2. And oops. These keys are so strange. And cat, because I know where the key is, but it says it's on a different key anyways. So we can actually remove F2 and cat F2, and you can see even before it ran the second part of the command, MGMT has woken up, fixed the state, and put it right back. Cool? So we're actually declaring the state in real time. And it's actually very efficient. Does that mean that because bash is slow or because you found the right hooks to um, I mean, bash is slow, but I mean it's not that slow. I mean look at how fast the whole thing runs in. I don't know if fast. Yeah, so in this case, so each resource has a way of detecting when the state might have changed. We program that into the core resources of each thing, and that will wake up the engine. Let me just show you how fast this actually is. I actually, you know the watch command? Um, watch is a little thing that just runs something over and over again as fast as it can. And if you just run it, you can see that the engine, just as fast as it's going, it always basically um, wins and converges the state correctly. Make sense? So we do this for every kind of resource. Um, we even do this for virtual machines and all sorts of other things. So I'll show you that a little bit later. Um, any quick questions before we do this? So, um, so we do this for each kind of resource primitive that we've built. And we don't have all the resources in the world, so hopefully you can help build some more. For files, we use iNotify or FA Notify, those sorts of things. Uh, for service resources, we actually use systemd events. Um, I don't know if there's any system haters in the audience, but just from a, from a purely technical point of view, before systemd, we couldn't actually do this because uh, systemd and it just didn't give us events to do this. Uh, we have a systemd resource. If you use some other newfangled init system that you like more and it has events that tells you when services crash, then like, send us a patch to add that to MGMT. This is really a developer duocracy sort of thing. Um, exact, we, get, we can do exact resources. We have package kit events, so if a package changes, someone uninstalls a package or something, it will wake up and fix it, and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, any quick questions before I continue? Uh, yeah. The I notify, yep. so we're reading the logs of the file system? No, so what actually happens is the kernel actually has this really cool mechanism that's built in that helps us. And what happens is you can actually use this strange API and say, hi kernel, I'm interested in a particular file path or directory or something. And then if something changes to this file, please ping me. Correct. So my engine says, I'm curious about this file. It then goes to sleep. And if someone messes around, we wake up the engine. And then in response, we'll say, I think something might have changed. And then we check the state. So we don't have to needlessly recheck and recheck every puppet run. So in fact, not only are we faster for the first run, so our code is much better, let's be honest, I wrote it. <laughs> Other people wrote it too. But we're faster the first run, but we're also faster over time because we're not wasting resources unnecessarily. Um, so, and again, if you really don't like running this continuously, you can always run it in cron with a converged timeout of, say, you know, a minute, and then just keep running it in sort of puppet legacy mode if you want. Cool? Um, Question then. Yes. Uh, like, if you do that converged thing, like, it won't create the file again because it will be dead, right? I mean, um, so, I mean, normally you run it continuously to get this. Right. But obviously, if you converge and shut down, and then someone changes the state, you'll be behaving like puppet behavior. Right. But this is just the, sure, yeah, yeah. the more general solution. Yeah. Another question. Uh, it's one euro per question. Uh, sorry. Table to Adish. I'm just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> the, the, I, I know that the, I don't know, but I think that the new API changes very fast. Or, Seems stable. So the API in the yeah. kernel? No, it's yeah. solid. It's it's, this is solid. I mean, yeah, this has been around since the, two six. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm? An external API does not yeah, change right. at all. Right. Yeah, it's kind right. of annoying to say watch right. 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 yeah. because there's there's things that like I would like added to this API, for example. But instead, since they don't break the old APIs, they've actually added new APIs that do those things. So yeah, so this is solid. Uh, but if you don't believe it's solved, try it out and file a bug. I mean, test this out. All, just to be clear, um, everything you see here, all the demos, all the examples, it's all free software, it's all open source, whatever you want to call it, all the code is there, and you can try these demos at home. And hopefully you do. So let's move on. Wait, yeah, go ahead. I mean, it's not related. It's more related to the package key. Yeah. And, uh, Please only support package kit for so, package installation. So we support um, very limited things based on what we have energy to code. So if there's a thing that you don't have in MGMT, we're happy to take a patch for it. The reason we pick package kit is because package kit actually um, has all these backends for everything from Arch to Debian to Ubuntu to SUSE and even shut I don't even know what it does. Like I think there's like a Gen2 thing in there. So the, the cool thing is we get this daemon that comes with the system that has all these backends. And the reason I wanted to do this is I wanted to guarantee that from day one, we had support for Debian and Fedora. You know? So I work for Red Hat, it's nice they pay me money, but like Debian's pretty cool and I like that community. And so I don't want to do like a Red Hat only thing because I'm running an upstream, not like a product thing. So um, ask me more about this. I'm going to show you more stuff. Let's see more demos. Uh, this question. Uh, well, this, this, this state only, for example, you mentioned it recreates the file if it's removed. Yes. Does it also remove packages if they're added, for example? Ask me after. I'm going to show more stuff. So okay. there's more demos. Um, if it's relevant to the question, we'll do it right now. Otherwise, because I have so much stuff, then you're going to I think you'll like seeing it. So just to show you, so I had this thing with these files where they disappear. So I think this is what I believe is what I see as config management. But I think this is actually another technology built in at the same time. Um, does it feel like anything else in addition to you? In addition to just pure config management? I see some strange expressions from the chat. Um, I think this is a little bit like monitoring. So it won't be a full comprehensive monitoring solution. But as a system in or a DevOps guy who's like um, written some code, like managed it with config management, put it in production, oh wait, I can't because I have to be monitoring and set up all that shit first. So this way, you actually have some level of per rows, per resource notifications about when things happen. So hopefully, it should make your monitoring story a little bit easier. Um, sorry if I don't look all the way over here as much. I get next train, I will die. Um, so anyway, it's just something to think about, um, and let's move on. So here's just a quick uh, drawing that I made. It's not very good because Libra Office is hard. But um, I, um, so this is a uh, scenario where we have a server and a whole, whole bunch of clients that connect to that server to do some operation. Uh, what's this topology called? Call it out. No, you know what this is called. What's this topology called? Client server. Client, client server. Excellent. Correct? It is centralized. Um, this is what software uses this? What config management software uses this topology? Loud. Wow. Oh, what? Yeah, say it. Puppet uses this. Um, what's the problem with this topology? What's a problem? Single, single point, point of failure. failure. What's another problem with this? Scaling up, right? So if you have thousands of these clients, this can be a big problem. Um, let's look at a slightly different topology. This looks almost the same, except now we have uh, this thing called Orchestrator, which it initiates connections to a whole bunch of machines. Um, this is what is called a central orchestrator. When you use the word orchestrator, it means a central thing. Okay? People misuse this term. This is the correct term as far as I'm concerned. What's the problem with this topology? Call it out. Single point of failure. It's a single point of failure. What's another problem with this topology? You need to be able to reach all the time. Well, you have to reach them. But fence okay. safety. What? Fence safety. Um, well, simpler. Keep it simple. What we mentioned just before. Right. Scale also, right? So this has the same problems as this one, right? If you had a thousand of these or a very large number, this could actually be a problem. So just something to think about. It's a useful topology, so is this one, but um, you have to understand what they're for and what we want to build. So just well, think about it. The good part of the orchestrator is that if it dies, the other things continue running, right? And they don't well, they usually depend on the... the so the semantics of how your software works and whether it needs the thing live or not is a whole other question. But just in general, there are some limitations to these topologies, which may or may not affect your production stuff a lot or not. So um, 
Fair point. So um, here's actually what we don't do with MGMT. This is just a peer topology where every peer connects to every other peer. What's the problem with this topology? Yes. It's, it's crazy. It's it's crazy. crazy. What, what's, a, what's a fundamental physical problem? Tell me. Too many connections. Too many connections, right? So if this number of peers <coughs> is very, very large, you quickly have far too many connections than, than you really can deal with. So here's what we actually do in MGMT. Everyone is a peer in the cluster. And what we actually do is we use a protocol called RAFT, which is a really cool distributed protocol that elects some core number of center machines, or core machines, to actually have a, a full mesh amongst themselves. And then every other peer connects to one of those. Okay? So this is how we can scale this easily to a 1,000 hosts, uh, no problem. Um, and the cool thing about this, yeah. so this basically builds up the topology. Yeah. It will do that. I'm going to show you this. So hold on for a second. Um, so what this it will build itself automatically, and the cool thing is if one of these central core machines dies, it can automatically re-elect a new one. And what we actually do in addition to this is we use this central core machine to run a distributed database called etcd, which we actually bake into the code and run that for us. And we use that in MGMT uh, for some stuff, which I'm about to show you. So want to see a demo? Or no? Demo? No? Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just go here. Oops. could do it with five VMs, but it would be really slow because if my laptop is still back there, you'll see it's a piece of shit. Um, don't push the buttons, please. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a very simple demo where each machine is going to start up and it's going to create one file resource on itself. The second thing it's going to do is it's going to push a virtual file resource, a different one, into this distributed database that I talked about. The second thing it's going to do is it's going to look in that database and pull down all of the file resources that it sees there. If I do this, how many files will I see on the first machine? For just one host running. So I put one file on myself, virtual into the database, and pull it down. How many will I have? How many? What? How many? You, you say the only one machine is running? Correct. One. Day. Well, so there'll be one file that I create myself, and then one that I pull down from the database. So I should have two. Let me just run this, and I think it'll become a little bit more. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to run MGMT. I'm going to point it to that simple graph, um, and I just add some options to say I'm on host in each one because I want to cheat because they're all running on the same machine, and these are just because I'm running in a dev environment. So I'll just run this and see what happens. So it starts up, and very quickly you see, uh, oh, sorry, um, I actually picked a different demo. So what I'm doing, I'm not even creating a file myself, it's even easier. I'm putting one file up into the database, and I'm pulling down everything in that database. So I just have, as you see, one file. Okay? Now, normally you could just start up a whole bunch of machines, but I can do this one at a time just so you can see the evolution. So over here, let's start up a second machine. Um, <laughs> this might look like a bit of a mess, but it's actually the same operation. The only difference is I now point it to the IP address of any existing machine in the cluster. That's how they join. So there's some cluster running. Anyone new wants to join, you can tell it where that cluster is. And because I'm running on the same machine, I have to give it two different uh, ports because it has its own service and listening. So same thing is going to happen. I'm going to put one file up into the database and pull everything down. So how many files do I see on the second machine? Call it out. Don't be shy. I won't scream you if you get it wrong. Two. two, right. So we pushed up one file in the database, which is sitting there. Now we're getting a second one. It will pull down those two. This first machine is watching that database in real time as well. So when it sees a new entry, it's going to pull that down. Let's run this and see. So you see it gets the second one, and then very quickly this guy wakes up and sees the second file. I'm going to do it with the third one. Same sort of thing. How many files will we see on each machine now? Three. three. All right, now we're counting with James. <laughs> so very quickly, the whole thing converges. Let's talk about what we're actually doing when we do this weird thing. This is actually a really simple algorithm. Everyone here comes into a conference room, and everyone puts their name basically in the hat. Say, here's my name. 
and everyone else reads the hat and can see who's in the conflict zone, right? So we're doing a simple uh, name exchange, basically. An algorithm we're so familiar with naturally, uh, but this is what it actually might look like. Um, a similar sort of model, so this could be used for discovery of what's the poster there, for example. Um, a simple, uh, similar example is suppose you had a bunch of these where one of them was um, a load balancer and all the other machines were uh, web servers. So as those web servers started up the services in real time and start up Apache or whatever the cool kids are using these days, um, yeah, it's not Apache, uh, Nginx or whatever, they would put this firewall rule into this database, whereas the load balancer could be watching that firewall, watching in that database for firewall rules. So when that web server comes up, the load balancer instantly opens up a port uh, forward to that uh, web server and that sort of thing. So all these fancy exchange operations are quite powerful when they work in real time. Um, Want to start up a, a fourth machine, just for fun? Start up. Um, oops. I have a relevant question. You mentioned etcd. Yeah. Uh, is that going to conflict with CoreOS is built in etcd or? No. So actually, what we did is we actually um, our project is written in GoLang. And we actually embed the etcd code base into our project. So the server, the etcd stuff, is actually running in our binary. <coughs> what about, like, isn't there some default ports or some settings that might, you might conflict that way? It doesn't conflict at all. I mean, if you pick the same port to run on, yeah, then you would have etcd running. But you can either change the ports you run your etcd on, or you can pick different ports for your own. Um, basic stuff. Um, I recommend you change the default port in your source code so that people, when they, so they don't, you know. So, um, so if they accidentally run both at the same time, they're not trying to use the same port. Yeah, it's not like, um, it's still pretty early and, I don't know, we haven't really had anyone complain about this yet, but uh, if you think it's really important, send us a patch. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> we're really very patch -based. I've received use. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, the, <laughs> Legitimate issues are legitimate, and people that care about these issues uh, send the patches and they get the things they want. Um, and it should be a nice patch. So, if you really want that, um, yeah. So, um, just to show you, um, if I uh, actually just ask the cluster how many members are there, we can actually see that there's uh, three clusters that have all joined. Um, and we can actually even do. Um, and even play games, and we can ask the cluster. Uh, we want there never to be more than three hosts as uh, primary core members. So we can do that. We can actually now, for example, oh. we can actually start up a fourth one, for example. You'll see now they have four files everywhere. And then if we do something funny, like uh, say now I want up to five servers. Um, we actually see, you'll see that the uh, fourth machine was not elected as a core member. Um, and then you can even do fun things like say, now I've changed my mind, I want there to be up to five members. And you'll see that uh, this fourth one got promoted to being master. So you can play with this if you want. Uh, kind of elastically scales out the cluster and manages it for you. Any questions about this? This is RAF? It's RAF. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's a demo. This has nothing to do with Etsy. Um, so we Etsy uses RAF, and we take advantage of that uh, whole code base because we don't want to write our own RAF implementation. We do all this magic for you automatically. Um, yeah. So those are the three main things: the parallelism, the event-based stuff, and the distributed system stuff. Now I could stop if you're all tired and fed up with me, or I can show you some sort of additional stuff if you're not bored. So if you're bored, uh, please snore. Um, no. Final question about yeah. that. There's no yeah. way to disable the built-in version of the uh, system version. You mean like an external entity? Yeah. Oh no, you can definitely use an external entity. If you want to run your own entity cluster because for some magic reason you are if you have the best entity cluster and you want MGMT just to leverage that, um, any time you point up, uh, any time you, uh, any time you start up a machine. Um, this IP address here is um, to be your etcd cluster. So MGMT will use any etcd cluster you point at, including its own. Um, and in fact, it's very safe. It puts all of the data that it writes under an underscore MGMT prefix. So it won't even clash with any existing data unless you have underscore MGMT. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Sounds good? You're smiling, you're happy about that. <laughs> I don't care if you want to run. We think it's easier if we manage the NCD cluster for you, but we're more than happy for you to do it yourself. I mean, it makes it better because then if you talk to my shit, you won't be unhappy. But um, it actually doesn't even really matter because even if you were to warp this, MG, this NCD cluster, there's no data that we can't regenerate. So it's all completely um, data that you don't need to back up that goes in there. Just transient data that gets pushed for communication. So, uh, really good question. Uh, there are stickers for people who ask good questions, so don't be shy. Um, so I'm just going to kill all this really quickly. Yes. I don't want to wait for this. Uh, no, there we go. All right. I'm going to show you a few more things if you are interested. Um, so, uh, I showed you this. Um, this I'll skip for now. Um, and I'm going to skip this too. Okay. So, here's uh, a random graph that I drew. Uh, sorry, it's ugly. Um, there's three package resources, uh, two file resources, and a service resource. Um, what is the problem with this graph? Um, it's not a major problem, but uh, are there any particular things that could be improved with this graph? If you were to run it. Sorry? Uh, yeah. It's, it's true that, that this piece here is separate from this piece, but that's okay. That just means these pieces can run in parallel. Um, what about if you ran this with Puppet? What would you see if you ran this with Puppet and if there were any problems? So three packages, two files, and some service. Why won't get such points and you don't have No, uh, it's smart. So this will probably happen first, uh, then this, and this will happen, let's say, and then this will, <coughs> will only happen once. So these are just dependencies. It doesn't mean that because there's two arrows to it, it happens twice. So that's not it. Um, I'll show you. So what actually happens is, as you know, since Puppet is can only run one thing at a time, what's actually going to happen is it's going to start up the package manager, install Kause, shut down the package manager, and then it's going to install <coughs> SL, shut down the package manager, and then start it up again. So this is just a lot of overhead because every time you start up the package manager to do some operation, it has to check the database for safety and all this crazy shit, so this takes forever long. If you run Puppet and you've installed like six packages at the same time, you know what I'm talking about, right? Nod your head to prove it. There's some people on their phones, this is bad. Okay, so what we actually do is in MGMT, as part of the core engine, we actually analyze the graph dynamically and we can actually figure out uh, using some, uh, I don't know, computer stuff, that this graph here, <laughs> not an hour, an hour, I'm not like a CS like super geek, but um, we actually can rearrange this graph to actually group all of these three resources into the same bubble. And, and this actually, if you check the arrows, they're actually all preserving the same requirements. <laughs> the difference is, we'll do this as a single operation, which makes things way faster, because we just ask the package manager once to do this. Now, you can also disable this per resource if you don't want to, but uh, you want to see a demo? Yeah. Okay, so let's just do this. I think I have, let me just do this. So it's basically those three packages. Um, uh, I'm going to actually I think I have like a root terminal here. Right. Hey root terminal. Let's do. Uh, oops. Um, oh. Um, hmm. Just put that. Because you don't actually need root, but it's fun um, for installing packages. So, oh yeah, I need to put the path. Because this is now um, James code. Okay, should try that. So, you'll see that it actually, it's not super fun in terms of visuals, but it actually took that graph and group the three things all into the same time. Now, if the internet is working, you'll see now that CalSAT is installed. Phew, it works. Um, and um, you can obviously, like, uh, need another root terminal. Just uh, see if this works. I didn't want to type my root password over this shitty keyboard. That's why I'm not using more terminals. Oops. Uh, if I were 
to
run two MGMTs at the same time. So uh, let's just run this uh, MGMT here. So it's going to start up, declare the state, and you can see very quickly it actually starts up a VM and it's now running. Um, and the cool thing, internal please, um, if you push, oh, there's some lag here. Running out of batteries. Oh, whoops, I'm here. <laughs> Tell me, I'll take it. I'll do that. Um, we just need to be running out of it. I'm going to rotate it slightly. Yeah, not perfect. Let's see how it's going to push. There we go. So uh, if we just destroy, if I just kill that machine, you can see that MGMT notices and it starts it right back up. So destroy it, you see it just puts it right back up. You can also just undefine the machine, for example, um, and so on. So we're actually declaratively managing the state of your virtual machines. Your virtual machines, we have a container resource, you can do this too. Um, anything you want, you can actually build all these cool things because we have this event mechanism that knows when something changes and we can respond to what it. What happens when you cannot restore it? Imagine QMU, it's being funny. So there's no reason that a resource can't have a fatal error, right? So each resource, we hope, can actually fix the state. But yeah, there could be some reason that QMU is on fire and just some bug, and then it will return an error and so on. And how you deal with errors in the graph is a whole other topic. So we actually have metaparameters that can let you retry an operation a certain number of times and so on. Uh, I've talked about this otherwise on my blog and stuff, but I'm not going to show it today. Uh, do you so have any sort of FM to monitor what you have? Yeah, yeah. So this is all built in. So um, let's, I'll show you a demo of that, but ask me after if you want to know more about it. Happy to tell you. So let me just show you um, a little bit. Uh, let's build on top of this. So let me just check. Oops. Have a iPod. constantly 
change the graph um, and just starts up and shuts down VMs on the fly. So very, very efficient, um, which you can use. So this can actually be, say in the future, um, this could actually, instead of be a human changing here, this could be like a load variable. So if the load goes up, you actually automatically start booting up new VMs and all sorts of cool stuff. Right? And we're just giving you an engine to build whatever dream infrastructure you want to build. Do you like this? Cool? Do you want to see another demo? Okay, I took this a little bit farther because I'm a crazy person. I'm just going to close this. Now, uh, and you can see, I don't know if you saw, but MGMT, it's running in debug mode, so it spits out all sorts of crap. But it's, it's going very, very fast. So very, very efficient. Um, to do this a little bit crazier, I actually um, have a remote laptop, which I hope is awake. Because as you can see, my laptop is quite shit. Um, and I'm just running screen on it. And I'm just going to go over here. And I'm going to open, you know, screen is just a thing that lets me see stuff. So I'm just going to run two screen sessions. So this is the same remote machine, just multiple windows. So what I actually have on this remote laptop is I have MGMT running on the left. On the right here, um, I have, oops, I have on this machine, uh, I'm running MGMT and I've asked it to create one virtual machine, please, which is running. And I'm going to log into this VM, which is right here. So this is actually on that, on that machine. Now I'm going to hide the MGMT just because it's boring to look at that. And instead, I'm going to show you this shitty shell script which I ran. Just a shitty shell script. Again, this is in the repo. And all it does, instead of a web UI, I just made this little shell script that will change the graph. Just basically change the resource. It's very simple. Now what I can do over here is I just want to show you. This is a really crappy VM. It's got one CPU. And for fun, I actually type this. I'm actually going to run the watch command with LSCPU, and I'm going to grab for that CPU thing. So now I actually am on this VM, which shows you in real time how many CPUs there are. Now my little shell script, all it does is it changes the declared value of the number of CPUs in the bird resource. So watch what happens when I press the plus key. And if you see, as I push plus on the, this side, this value here is changing up and down. So what's actually happening? What's actually happening is every time I change the number of CPUs that I want, MGMT says, oh, there's a new re the resource has changed. It's not what we actually want. And so it actually works out the CPU hot plug commands or hot un unplug commands to add those CPUs to the VM or remove them on the fly. And this happens, as you can see, in you know, milliseconds. You like that? I see a smile. That's cool, right? So this is the cool thing about MGMT resources. You can just build these beautiful resources. They're very simple and fairly straightforward to build. And you can change properties and have those properties get changed in real time. And you get all of the power of the MGMT engine to do this. I did this for VMs because I think VMs are cool. You might want to do this with you know, some other thing that you have in mind. Some other resource type, whether it be a network cards, uh, coffee makers, bananas, I don't know. Um, think of something cool and build this in. So you can really have these high level powerful resources. Um, just because some people are always like, what's this script doing? It's also in GitHub on the project. But it's really just taking this graph, and it's just a, a little Persis thingy I built uh, that changes the CPU count. So in fact, um, oops. Oh, boy. What's going on? You press the key and it doesn't work in this is really confusing. Declare value, and it will fix that. Right, let's get out of this. Uh, 
Um, okay. So, um, so that's some stuff. Um, if you want to actually write your own resource, again, these are what we have now. Um, we have August. Uh, we have an nspawn container resource. Uh, we have some weird resources like password, which does some fun stuff. Again, I'm not going to talk about this today. Service. We have timers that were actually built in. Uh, all sorts of cool things. If you want to add something to the end of this list here, please get involved. Uh, this is the one part of the docs which are actually pretty decent. Um, I wrote uh, a resource guide. It shows you what APIs you need to implement. It's very simple, and you can go look at it online. Um, and if you have questions, like you can ping me, and I'll help you write this. Uh, it's in Golang. That's the only catch. Everything is in Golang. Oh, not everything. Kernel still in C. Um, but yeah, so pretty easy to write new resources. Just be inventive and imagine uh, what you want to write. Uh, the gentleman over here, I believe, was asking about errors and stuff. So we actually have a whole bunch of metaparameters that uh, are basically pieces of code that apply to every resource automatically. So you can retry after a certain delay, after a certain number of times for failures, all sorts of other things, uh, walk-free semaphores, weird stuff. Again, out of scope for this talk. Um, a few other just random things, and then we can ask more questions if you have some. Um, MGMT itself can work as a standalone tool, but it turns out you can actually take the entire code base and embed it as a library into your existing projects. So instead of building some big complex project and then needing to have a way to talk amongst your software and do cluster membership and then declare state of things, you can actually use MGMT as a Golang library and have it do all this magic for you. Um, I work for Red Hat and the Gluster uh, folks, it's this distributed software, they're considering doing this, so I've been working on the storage team recently to explain them how these graphs work and all this stuff. So that's really meant as a proof of concept to show how you can build really powerful management software around your actual piece of software with MGMT. Um, this is some stuff we're not going to talk about today, but uh, there's blog posts about these things. Um, future work. This thing is really not done. It's getting closer and closer to like production ready, uh, but it's still not there. Um, I showed you this stuff. Um, we're building the language. Um, I hope to have a public demo of the language available in the next uh, few months um, if my talk at Config Management Camp is accepted, which I'm optimistic about. So if you're coming to that, I'll probably show this. That's a secret. Uh, new resources. Uh, we need a you know an HTTP resource to actually make requests over the network as a resource, a mount resource, a net resource for network cards. Um, I actually have most of the code of an MKFS resource. So you actually can declare the state of what file systems you want to have created and all sorts of other stuff. Use your imagination. Um, help me write new ones and add uh, parameters to existing ones. Uh, there's some etcd stuff and other things that are going on. This is really a community project. It's not a big corporate evil thing. Red Hat's been pretty good in leaving me alone and building the thing I wanted, uh, which is nice. Um, so really get involved. Uh, language, uh, a lot of stuff. As I mentioned, Mustard D is one thing I'm working on. Um, again, this is about you guys. Um, how can you help? Um, you can use this, test it, patch it, share it with your friends, document it, uh, start on GitHub if you're into GitHubbing, uh, blog it, uh, tweet it if you have Twitter. Uh, discuss it with your friends and just hack on it, right? This is a hacker thing. I think it's pretty cool. Hopefully it will make your lives easier. Uh, oh, that's big. Um, I have one marketing slide because Red Hat keeps paying me and it's nice to get paid to work on free software shit. So if for some reason you want to give them money, uh, they have a website, you can give them money. Um, uh, just to be clear, this is an upstream community project. It's not a product. I cannot buy this shit right now. Uh, maybe one day this will be something that is a product. I really don't know, but I'm just, I'm a tech guy, I don't care about product stuff, so that's someone else's problem. Uh, let's just recap. Oh, I can't really hear this very well, but it's Arthur Benjamin saying, you know, recap and putting the cat back on his pen. It's a bad joke. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, these are some links for you. You know, all know about the technical blog of James, right? Yes. I'm James, check it out. There's, I think, six, maybe even seven blog posts about MGMT stuff so far. So if you really want to start at the beginning and go through each topic in annoying detail, that's the place. Do you have a blog that is on Uh No. <laughs> this is the only blog of James, but that doesn't sound so good. Um, there's a GitHub page, so Purple Ideas, how I go on the internet, uh, slash MGMT, check it out. Uh, it's getting fairly popular. Uh, here's how you can search for all the old articles. And I'm Purple Idea on like IRC, Twitter, GitHub, Gmail, and at redhat.com. Uh, so if you want to annoy me, uh, preferably nicely, don't be shy. Um, 
this is just some dumb things because I throw fireballs and like magic sometimes. Um, I need your help. If you like this talk, I need you to help me DOS LH over there. Go up to him at some point after this is over and tell him if you like the talk. And if like, you know, 40 of you go up or 30, it will be annoying for him and fun for me. And we'll get good feedback on if the talk was pleasant. So sorry, uh, it's, it's what happens if you're an organizer. Uh, it's my new idea. I tried this at Config Management Camp with Chris, and he got like so many people going up to him, and it was awesome. And he was like, dude, you're DOS. And I'm like, this is uh, DDoS, actually. Um, so, um, three things. Uh, we have an IRC channel. It's MGMT config on Freenode. We're maybe like 50 or 60 people in there hanging out, uh, talking about random tech things. Please come work with us if you have IRC. Um, we have like a Twitter account for some reason. There is a bot that you can command to ask it to tweet things for you if you're into Twitter. And we have a mailing list. Um, I don't know why this is funny. It's not the funny part. The funny part is after. You no, know, the, the, we have a mailing list. Um, I struggled with hosting, and Red Hat eventually gave me hosting because it's free, and why not? It's mailman, it works. So if you want to join, it's extremely low volume. There's probably been like 20 messages since I started the list which isn't too long ago, but announcements about NGMT stuff or questions or anything else, uh, feel free to subscribe um, and uh, get involved. Um, I have a few more other demos if you're really bored, but I wanted to actually stop and not overwhelm you and see if there's any questions you guys have. Or girls. Yes? Why are there demos? Sorry. Writing your own great language? question, great so question. Easy. Yeah, absolutely great question. So the reason we need to build a language that MGMT, the engine, will run is for a very simple reason. We want to be able to describe um, potentially complex distributed systems, like clusters of whatever systems are running. And describing these infrastructures, we want to do so in an extremely safe way. Because if you make a mistake in your code, you don't want to blow away the entire data center, because this would be bad. So we want to make this extremely safe, and we have some very complex patterns, such as the exchange of resources, when I did that NCD thing, and other things, which actually express some very fancy back and forth stuff, but we want to make it easy to understand for the user. So because of this reason and others, we actually need to build um, a language. And the kind of language we're building is actually a declarative, functional, reactive programming language. So the language itself will let you potentially write code like if load, some load variable, is greater than four, do this. Start up this many machines. Otherwise, that sounds like good script. Though. That's not JavaScript. Well, it's um, declarative, it's functional, and reactive. So maybe I'm not even aware. So when we're talking about um, JavaScript is not a declarative language. Uh, declarative languages, hmm? no, no, it, declar JavaScript is an imperative language. So um, in a declarative language, if you were to do something like x equals 3 and then x equals 4, it would be um, a compile error because redefining variables, for example, can potentially hide bugs and it's an unsafe thing. So this is one of many mechanisms that we build into the language to make it both easy and very safe to write code. And for this and more, um, we actually have to unfortunately build a language. I spent an absurd amount of time trying to see if there's an existing language that I could repurpose or edit, and I just could not find one. Having said that, um, the engine is actually very modular. So if you want to implement a different language, or JavaScript, or uh, use MGMT as raw, with raw Golang APIs, you can do all of those things. You can even, for example, take Puppet code and compile it in. So there's a specific API you implement into the engine to be able to push in your own graphs. And that's what you, can, that's what you use for Puppet, that's what we're going to use for our new language, and that's what we use for the YAML struct. So, um, really good question, but uh, hopefully when I present it publicly, you'll you know, click in your head and you'll say, unfortunately, we need a new language. Uh, great question. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, first question is, I have a couple. Both two. You get one. one. Okay, uh, one. Go license. Right. What's the license of this code? It's uh, GPL. So, um, three. It's three? Yeah. The, it's actually, I hate to talk about licensing questions because it's always a more tech. Um, there's a very difficult reason why we chose this. Um, basically, if you know some of the stuff that happened in the Puppet community and other communities, they did this open core thing where it was like Pachi licensed, and then they now have pieces that are proprietary only, and they basically said fuck you to the community. So 
sorry. Did I say that? Sorry if I defended it. So we realized that when we have like uh, all this code runs typically on your own private infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So by putting it under copyleft, it was a way of us saying that we're not going to screw you over by doing an open core version. And that's why we chose that a lot of people we discussed this, and that seems to be the best thing. So you can actually have completely proprietary forks um, in your own private infrastructure as long as you want. The only thing that, that stops you from doing is if you wanted to actually sell a proprietary right. config management tool that has bonus features and they're proprietary only, that's what it stops. Yeah, you kind of ship Correct. Uh, this with an So this stops, this stops Puppet Labs, for example, from doing a proprietary fork of our engine. Right. But any sysadmin who wants to use this, they can do whatever they want in the privacy of their own data center, and it will not stop you. So that's why we make this license. Uh, another question. Yes, sir. Who's using this in production? So as far as I know, no one is actually really using this in production yet. Um, unofficially, I guess I can sort of friendly tell you that there's at least some people playing around with it for use in different things. Um, it's not stable. We're definitely pre-1.0. Um, it does a lot of stuff already, which you can use as is if you want to do something. Uh, but we're not calling it stable, and we're not encouraging it for production use. You understand how it works, and you're OK with the certain features that exist today, by all means, go ahead and use it. Um, it is fully, uh, as far as I'm concerned, production ready for use embedded by using the Golang APIs. The biggest missing piece is that generating the graphs is either you write this nasty YAML file or you wait for the language. Um, but you can actually use the Golang APIs to actually um, write Golang code that generates the graph. So if you want to do it that way, that's also quite usable today. If you have a company you work for and you want to use this for something and you want some help, uh, ping me. I'll see what I can do to help you. Um, if you contribute coding time to fill in the gaps that you want, I'll help you get the things that will hopefully make your data center suck less. Is that a fair deal? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Is there a comparison table between you and competitors? I don't want to be like a total dick about this, like, oh, my tool is faster. I mean, well, it's clearly faster, so. It's clearly faster. Um, I think that <laughs> mentioning this in talks is enough. Um, at some point, you know, you can see in the marketing things like, Puppet doesn't do this, doesn't do this, MJMT and all the check marks. I don't know. Uh, like, if you had a patch that you sent to the From docs. From user perspective, it's kind of nice to have so fair conversions. And actually, it's kind of trendy right now, this. So, so, I don't want to do that personally. But if you wanted to write the patch to the docs folder that have like a Markdown comparison table, then I will look at this patch, and if no one backs it, then I will merge it. Is there anybody who does like even close to what this is gonna be doing? I mean, Terraform. Terraform. So, so here's the thing. So again, I, I like a lot of the stuff the HashiCorp people have done, but Terraform like misses the point in some respects in that it doesn't have these events, right? So in a way, we could actually build a cloud resource like an AWS resource. Um, that does this sort of thing, and now you have the engine running, it runs in parallel, and it reacts and changes um, when you have the state. So if we add more resources, I think this starts to look more and more like Terraform, in a way. Um, we see it a bit differently, but... Um, is it because Terraform doesn't have as granular events, or, or it's not there's, there's, there's no events. There's no events. This is, this is one of the fundamental pieces that I've been thinking about for years, which is Puppet, uh, Chef, all these tools, cannot do this event thing. When you add this one piece, the whole thing gets very, very interesting. Because the events is basically, so what actually happens in the code, behind the scenes, um, is each resource um, has a go routine which it starts up with the event code. And it's basically a big for loop, like a big main loop per resource, that is sleeping in a select operation, um, which is basically just waiting for something to happen and wake up. But because we have this main loop per resource, you can actually build resources that do things. So we can actually have a potentially an HTTP server in a resource that does stuff. Um, and all sorts of stuff because now we have a main loop per resource. You don't have to use it, but it's very powerful when you do. That's the big change. Uh, I, like, uh, I thought Terraform still like monitored the state oh, of the it, it holds. Well, it does monitor to reach a specific goal, right? Yeah. So it's infrastructure as code. So you define that that is your goal. Right. Whereas here it's more like event driven. But right. I'm not sure if Terraform can be configured with the TCD. So <coughs> I'm not sure. It just it's not a distant Terraform. I think they've done some great things. Mm -hmm. 
And to be honest, what I'm most likely to do is want to port some of the resources uh, from Terraform to MGMT. Like, because we haven't built an AWS resource and so on, and actually using the Golang SMK to go out and talk to Amazon and so on. All these different things are great, but we want to actually run continuously. Terraform runs, it does the things, it waits for your VMs get built, and then eventually it exits. And then when you want to run it again, you run it again. So it's still fundamentally pulling, which was, I think, a mistake. Um, that's just a fundamental design decision. Um, I hate to say it, I wish Terraform had done this, and I wouldn't have to build MGMT, but they didn't do this. So um, you, you do well, let's, let's rotate and I'll give you another one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the relationship you think you can, that MGMT can have with uh, Kubernetes? Because I see that can be yes. like an orchestration uh, so, uh, software, yeah. so if you implement like uh, a container, for example, a yep. resource, you can do something. That's a really great question. Um, so, uh, it's a complex question. So, everyone heard the question okay? <laughs> um, so, it's true that we could, we could actually, we have our container resource, and we could actually do some fancy stuff uh, around that, describing MGMT things that build out of infrastructure. Um, it's a little bit politically different, difficult because Red Hat is a big Kubernetes, like, sort of, they're into this thing. They have this thing called OpenShift, which has yeah. Kubernetes and containership built in. So I'm my goal is not to compete with Kubernetes. I think it's a if you're into centralized orchestrators, which is what Kubernetes is, it's a I suppose a reasonable uh, way to manage your containers. But fundamentally, um, at least initially, Kubernetes just has that one container resource. They now have this third-party resource thing as tacked on, but uh, our, the core design is a little bit different. Um, I am prefer the distributed design that I have going. And the second thing that I think we're doing substantially different than Kubernetes is that we're building this language that allows you to describe these things. At the moment, Kubernetes um, just has this giant YAML file and it's like, yeah. fill this in with all these parameters. So long term, I obviously think I have a better design, but it's not a core goal right now to compete with Kubernetes. Um, if anything, you could write a Kubernetes resource uh, to describe the state of Kubernetes and have MGMT do that. That would be probably something on the short term. Long term, will we compete with Kubernetes? I don't know. Depends what people want to hack on, and if that's something you want to build, then get involved. Um, yeah. good, really good, really great questions. Um, any other questions? There's some gentleman, you had another question, and some over here had another question. Yeah? About uh, monitoring? About uh, monitoring, yeah. I don't know too much, but I heard that Mac measures and yeah. these systems are not scalable. So this approach would be interesting to make monitoring scalable. Um, so monitoring is a sort of side effect. It's not my core like passion. Um, however, um, we do think it will actually help make the whole problem a lot easier. Um, so per resource, getting events and being able to notify of things. Um, as an addition. Um, I had the idea, but someone else had it independently, which was to actually add Prometheus support into MGMT. And someone actually wrote this patch. So we have basic Prometheus support, which is basically a monitoring type thing where MGMT uh, sends events to, M to Prometheus. So you can actually know how many resources are up, how many fail, and all this other stuff. So if you are into Prometheus and you want to do that together, uh, basic support's already there, and more is possible if you want to add it. So hopefully this will make your life easier. And uh, you tell me, you're the, it's your data center. Um, patches, send the patches, yeah. Question? Yeah. The thing is, uh, when you get declarative, yep. this declaration uh, is like describing the whole infrastructure. So mm -hmm. it's like <coughs> kind of absurd to have to describe it, to manage it, and also to monitor it. Correct. Like, mm, I don't know, like, uh, it, it should be quite easy to just upgrade uh, the, the management software to take I, care of, of the... Yeah, I, I completely overwhelmingly agree, right? So the whole beauty of declarative programming, I wrote an article on my blog recently about this, about declarative versus imperative. You just literally say, I want my data center to look like this, whatever it is, and if you build all the resources and describe it properly, then it runs, you wait some time, and it should converge. This makes it very, very easy. 
Um, if you build each resource to be very powerful, and then you use the graphs to describe them all together, the engine figures out what math it has to do to get you from A to B, which should make it, you know, pretty dope. Is this thing recording me? Yes. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Don't. Don't. This is, I thought this was all friendly. I was telling you shit like it was secret. Um, uh, if you don't want us to publish the video, we want it. Uh, Send me a copy, and I'll see. Okay. Like I, I said that. <laughs> but seeing me is not fun, seeing the screen is more fun. Yeah, it was, oh, but okay. we moved it for the question because it was so good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Maybe we can move to the kitchen, there will be some beer and cool. we can talk yeah. casually and happily. Thank you so much for coming, I hope you like this talk. Um, if you want a sticker, come grab me, I'll give you a sticker. I'll give you a sticker if you promise to use it on your laptop or something because there's like a sticker cartel and they're shit expensive. <laughs> oh God, it's absurd. I want to go into the sticker business. Forget the DevOps. Thank you very much.